everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Disc Golf Answer Man. I am Bobby Cool Daddy Slick Breeze. And I have with me Eric. What's up? What's up, McCabe? What's up? <laughs> Robert. Oh, hey, man. McCall. Hey, man. Oh, hey. <laughs> hey, man. How are you guys doing today? Uh, Fantastic. Excellent. Excellent. Ready Minus. for another uh, week of rain and snow and sleet? No. One day. No. One day of it. What is so funny, Robert? It just reminded me of The Office. In the very first episode, Michael is doing uh, Ryan's performance review. Oh. And he says, uh, I don't remember what the category is, but he goes, uh, excellent. Yeah. That's what it sounded yeah. like when you were uh, just saying that. Excellent. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. All right, well, we were back in the studio last week. We had Paige Pierce in standing in for Eric McKay, but Emac is back on the attack with back. his... Big Mac. I don't know. Nice. Just to make rhyme. My no more rhymes. I mean it. It's my endorsement. <laughs> it's your endorsement for the Big I get, Mac. I get a quarter every Big Mac sold. <laughs> it's a pretty good deal. That's not bad. That's not a bad That's deal. They're going to be feeling good. Not a bad deal. I, haven't, I haven't got those checks yet. but. So what's going on with course design, Eric? Um, good stuff. I'll actually be heading south on next Monday. Okay. So I will not be here next Tuesday for Answer Man, but mm-hmm. I will be um, somewhere... If, just south of us, okay. designing a, an 18-hole. Mexico? It, that is south of us. <laughs> nice. You are correct. Venezuela? That's you one, are, that's you, one you of know, the if options. If you go far enough south, you can go north. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> if you go far enough south, you could be in Canada. <laughs> that's true. So, um, but no, I'm looking forward to that one. Um, I'll have more details about it here in the next uh, couple weeks. Excellent. Maybe I can call in next Tuesday and yeah. kind of talk about it. Yeah, we'll that'd be good. There. Noise. So. And Roberts, uh, you and I were talking earlier because I was getting a roster of all our players that are be at the memorial, and and, and we me we met with Jeremy talking memorial plans. Yeah, you getting excited about starting to travel again for some disc golf and get the big disc golf season started? Of course, yeah. Starting off the uh, season with the memorial is always it's kind of like our kickoff to the season. I know that the players play right Vegas before, but that's usually the first big event that we get to go to. Um, and it's super fun to get out on the road, see everybody. Uh, we've actually gotten to see a lot of the players in Emporia during mm-hmm. the off season, so yeah. that's been cool. But yeah, I'm I'm uh, super stoked to get back out there. Excellent. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, we've seen some players. In fact, right now, Paige Pierce is here in town. Uh, of course, she did that disc golf management last week, and she re- uh, worked with uh, Danny on a new project that she's going to be doing called uh, what is what is it called again? Danny, nice line, nice line. Um, so Danny helped her with some of the graphic works and stuff like that and kind of coached her along. She's going to actually start uh, if she's the way I understand it is if she's playing uh, uh, around playing a tournament and she's on a card with somebody and she noticed they threw a nice shot. She's going to interview them after the mm-hmm. round and talk about it so that you can kind of learn from that per, for, learn from the experience that she just had of watching that shot. Um, but she's going to put it right on her own YouTube channel. So make sure you follow her. And I believe it's what is it or it's is it P Pierce? I don't know. Can we look that up real quick? Yep, I will, YouTube channel? It. I will check it out. Yeah, make sure people, I just kind of thought of that. We want to make sure people follow mm-hmm. Paige Pierce on that because I know she is super excited uh, about putting this. Yep, it's just Paige Pierce. Paige Pierce. So yep. she's working on that project. So we'll kind of give her some love and go subscribe and hit that notification bell uh, so she knows you guys appreciate. Yeah, hit the, uh, hit the bell or you're not even nice. Absolutely. Um, and then and then Bring she also recorded, um, if you follow us on Instagram, uh, make sure you follow our Instagram stories so you can see Danny's three reasons why, where he talks about different discs and he recruited the help of Paige. You were able to do that, Danny? Recruit the help of Paige Pierce to do a couple of the three reason videos? Yes, is the answer to that. He will tell you in 30 in, seconds. He's working on an ad yeah, right it's, now. It's kept trying to catch up. There we go. There it is. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. There's a delay. He's listening to the broadcast uh, as it's happening, but there's a delay. Anyway, so make sure you pay attention to that. Marty. Anything else going on, guys? Marty said, Uh-oh. hey, no sad music for the Chiefs loss. No. We weren't even going to talk about it. Why you got to be like that? Why I mean, be like that? I mean, it's cool. We, To me, it was a su- successful year. Definitely. It was a great year. Yeah, it was a great we, year for Mahomes. AFC great for the whole the team. The future is bright. Um, I, feel like, I feel like Mahomes is the type of guy you could build a program around at yeah. this point. You know, early in, early in the year, he had good success, and everyone was like, ah, it's just a flash in the pan. He won't do yeah. anything. He had a fantastic year. Yeah. Uh, and he took the goat to overtime. Yeah, and and if the if old uh, oh what's his name stupid coin flip Hill no no the, the guy didn't line off off sides. Oh yes yeah, yeah, that, yeah the game's yeah. over the defensive uh, line yeah that, that was interception a, was well, an interception and that's well, a not game. to mention that but same with the stupid pass or uh, roughing the passer. Oh call. that was Come brutal. On. Oh that was bad. Come on. You, were you at the game or no? No I didn't. Okay not so go. you saw the yep. yeah oh yeah I saw it was and the awful. Edelman uh, did you think he touched the ball? You could I would say the evidence to me. Okay here's the thing on that play. 
the rule on the field was he touched it. Right. And to me, it was too close to call. So when it's too close to call, the rule on the field stands. Yeah. And they even said that. Tony Romo even said that. And yeah. then they were still reversed it. Yeah. Just think if we didn't have the technology that, that yeah. the, the ruling on the field would have count, would have yeah. stand, stood, whatever. I, and you know what? I'm happy. I'm proud of my Chiefs, but I feel bad for you Saints fans. That was rough. Yeah. Yeah, because so, Shay talk, was talking talk about, about your it, missed calls, yeah. and I thought, and I thought, oh, that's that sounds yeah, cause bad. Yeah, you're driving back. Yeah, whenever, and, she, yeah. And, and so she was like, oh, Bobby, you missed it. At this, he hit him, and then no one saw him. I was like, man, that sounds rough. And then they showed. It. I was like, holy moly! Yeah, it's, it's she's eg- right. That's, it's yeah. egregious. Yeah, but it's really. To bad. be fair, there was also some pretty other awful calls throughout both games. Sure, so that, something's got to happen with this officiating right. in so, the future. Who said? I think Johnny V actually said it on a uh, 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 debate over different things, and he made a good point, or at least I thought it was where. Um, there's always going to be bad calls, and I'm, I'm totally paraphrasing. I'm sorry, Johnny, but there's always going to be bad calls. But the players have to play so that the game isn't decided by right. the referees. Yep. Yeah, true. which is fair. So That's that true. makes sense. That makes sense. So yeah. Anyway, anyway yeah. so yeah, of course we're not. We are saddened by their loss, but we're proud of our Chiefs. We have a bright um, future. And that, but that was a good game. That was a great game. Yeah. Yeah, no matter especially the, outcome, the way it that started. Was, that was a battle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The way if you it go, started. Yeah. I mean, we had 32 yards in the first half. I know. Right. Scoreless at halftime for us. Mm-hmm. Right. And yeah, to go from that to taking, you know, arguably the greatest quarterback of all time mm-hmm. to overtime. Come on. That's not bad. Yeah, that's not that's even a pretty arguably. good. That is. Yeah. He's he's the man. That was a he's been in sure. more Super Bowls than most teams. <laughs> right. Like their whole. <laughs> yeah. Their whole franchise. <laughs> <laughs> Ridiculous. It's pretty good. And I saw someone post, uh, like, right after said, all of a sudden, there are now hundreds of thousands of Rams, Rams fans. fans. yeah. <laughs> to say, you might that. have to count me in on and that, just cheering like that, him on on Super Bowl. Everybody's pulling for the Rams. I'm I pulling know. for Brady. I'm pulling for the GOAT. It looks better if we lose to the GOAT. Yeah, he's pretty good. That's true. Looks that's better true. if good we point. lose to the, the, the Super to the, Bowl yeah, champ. That's so. true. It will be. It should be a gig. I want though. him to win and then freaking retire. <laughs> Get right. out of here. Right, has, it, has there been any rumors <laughs> that he's going to retire? No. Well, he, people he, people are speculating. Because he's 40 now, right? Yeah. Uh, what does that mean? Pretty close. I just that's, Like he, he should just he's 18, go off into the he, green pastures? Yeah. If you're 40, he's, you might as well just walk into the woods he's and not older return. Than that, right? Because he is 18 years older than Mahomes. 41. He is 41. 41? He is wow. 18 yeah. years older than Mahomes. That's kind of crazy. Think about that. Man. 18 that's, years. That's pretty ridiculous. And he's been playing how much how much, how much oh. longer than Mahomes? 25 years. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> I'm just saying the experience pretty level. Pretty close, probably. Yeah, it was a, probably around right. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, we can move on. All right, so the football answer, man, Thank is brought you to you by <laughs> bringing that up. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. But we have no opinions on it, so yeah. <laughs> just kidding. We don't even need the disclaimer. Those are the opinions. Of hey, Penny. we have 150. Right? We have 150. Hey, we can start the show. So we can start the show. We've Let's already get started. It. All right, guys. Remember, as, as <laughs> always, you can submit your questions to discgolfanswerman.com, and we will try to get them on the air, and we will take, again, another 15. No, this time we'll take 23 minutes to answer them. Okay. I'm just kidding. Let's get it. Oh, no, actually, no, we're doing good. We're under 8, 10 minutes. Come we're on. Good. This one is from Charlie. Charlie bit my finger. <laughs> how do... Oh, did I ask this one? No. How did moon, How do moonshine and hybrid plastics compare to lucid in terms of stability? We did and ask that last we week. We did. So, Charlie, you do not get double. Why didn't I delete that? I don't know. I typically delete it. Uh, Charlie asks another question. Is it considered poor etiquette to play music at a moderate level while playing a casual round? Uh, I think that's just personal preference. For me, I absolutely don't mind. If somebody says, hey, you guys mind if I play some music? Sure, do it. If it's casual, I don't really care. Same. Even if it's a league, if we have tags yep. and there's something on the line, I still am okay with it. No personally. problem. Sanction round, no thanks. Here's the thing. Ask your group, though. Make sure yep. it's okay with the group. If the group says it's okay, then do it. You're golden. Right. Yeah. In fact, the def- definition of etiquette is the customary code of polite behavior in a society or among moder- members of a particular profession or group. So, it, so like group. you said, it all comes down to your group. You may go up to a group and say, hey, do you mind if I play some music? And they may say, hey, well, no big deal. You may go the very next day, play with a completely mm-hmm. different group, and ask the same question, and someone will say, "No, actually, I'd prefer you not to." So, but if it's like casual, majority of the time you're playing with sure. your buddies. Yeah. So, all right, uh, Kyle says, "Hey, disc golf buds, disc golf answer man buds, I like the I like throwing thumbers, but seem to only be able to get about 250 feet of distance with them. I was wondering if disc speed has any bearing on the distance for overhand shots, or if it's all in the technique and arm speed." I would go ahead and defer to you guys because based off this morning's meeting, I don't understand what speed is on a disc. So. <laughs> That's true. Um, and yeah, it it is exactly the same as how 
you would use speed when you're throwing a backhand or forehand mm-hmm. shot. Discs with a rider, a wider rim, a rider rim, a wider, I'm good wider. At talking sometimes. <laughs> a white. Are you hunting rabbit? Words. Uh, um, discs with a wider rim have greater distance potential. They can go farther if they are up to speed. So yes, is the answer to that. It does have bearing on the distance. There you go. But 250 feet is pretty far for a thumber. I'm. I'd be pleased. Yeah. Pretty far. I'd be okay, okay with it. I can't throw it that far. This one from Sean. What is up, Disc Golf Answer Man? This is Sean here from Michigan. I came out to work in Kansas for a summer internship. My friends got me hooked on Trilogy Plastic. Nice. I'm going back out in May for a long year-long internship, so in other words, a lot of disc golf will be happening. My question is, what DD Plastic is the best for that crazy wind, such as massive headwinds or crosswinds? Hoping to come out to Emporia again and visit soon once I'm out there. Keep it real. Nice. Very cool. I don't. I don't think it's necessarily a plastic type, but more of a disc selection, as far as the wind goes. Um, so for me personally, in my bag, I've got uh, a pretty overstable enforcer, brand new one that I'll, that I'll throw, and it it happens to be lucid plastic. Um, I think the lucid plastic tends to be a touch more overstable than the fusion, and I don't know if that's just because maybe the fusion beats in a little bit quicker. So for me personally, it's the uh, the lucid plastic that tends to be a little bit more overstable. Moonshine is a little bit more than lucid, but honestly, moonshine is basically lucid plastic. You know, similar feel, similar grip. So uh, I, I don't necessarily think that there's a particular plastic that works better in the wind as far as just get better at your uh, overstable mold selection. Yep, I will agree. I don't think it really has much bearing on plastic type. It's more mold that you like. Yep. Yeah. All right. This one's from Caleb. I've recently eliminated the extra movement in my putting that caused a lot of inconsistencies, but have also noticed a loss in power. Mm. How do you recommend getting more power on my putts without extra movement? Mm. The answer to that is probably going to be mo- mostly in your weight shift. Um, if you are, if you're used to having the same motion with your arms then that's really the only thing that you can change is your your legs and the amount of uh, back and forth that you have with your weight. So um, I would make sure first that you're following through completely every time that you, you're not just thinking, oh, I'm just going to try and get it there, but you're really popping the disc out. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you are doing that, then I think it's just getting your legs more involved, shifting your weight back a little bit more and then forward a little bit more. Or even for me, I, I kind of go down and up slash out. Uh, and so if I'm a little farther away from the basket, I definitely get my legs into it more yeah. and kind of have more of that spring into it. More body involved for uh, for more momentum. Yeah, definitely. Basically is what it's going to comes out to be. Gotcha. All right, next one comes from, we're going to go back to speak pipe. And this one is from Angelo. Check my levels here. Here we go. Hello, Disc Golf Answer Man crew. This is Angelo calling from Clarkston, Michigan, the frozen state. Right now we're at a whopping 18 degrees. No. And it's all we can do is just get ready and prep for the spring season. I have a question. What is your drink of choice while you are on the course besides water? How ironic. I- well, during hops and highs, what is that, Eric? <laughs> well, um, no, it's it's hot water. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Next question. Carry a 32-ounce Nalgene. And I also like to carry some form of hydration product other than water, like uh, an amino acid with electrolytes, or maybe even before my round, I will do a pre-workout drink. So that's all I got for now. Just trying to get some ideas for the upcoming season. Love what you guys do. Keep keeping on. And that's it. That's all I got. All right, man. Send me a plate of that arroz con pollo. Bobby. <laughs> nice. uh-huh. I wonder it if... sounded like it was like transistor radio. I, I, I was going to say, it like sounds like he just put, put a there. fuzz box in yeah, between himself and his. Or, I mean, it's Michigan, and he said it's really cold. So yeah, maybe so he was... <laughs> just... maybe, maybe that happens to your voice when it gets really maybe. cold. Maybe he was outside. Um, I usually just carry water while I'm on the course. Occasionally, I will take a uh, Dr. Pepper with me, but don't do that because <laughs> it's ill-advised. <laughs> yes, that is not good advice. Yeah, so that's that's why I said don't do that. I just take water. <laughs> Great. Very occasionally, it's not all the time, but uh, there was a minute where um, I would go to a disc golf tournament, play the first round, be good to go, whatever, but then kind of be like, especially the tournaments where I would drive to where I was going in the morning, 
uh, and it was like a three hour drive. So driving from Austin to DFW, those are long days. And so by noon, even though I just eaten, uh, most of the time I was pretty wiped. So I'd get a Dr. Pepper and that would help me kind of like, you know, pick my spirits up a little mm-hmm. bit more in the second round. Very rarely did I drink all of it. It was mostly just like, just a little bit. It makes it sound like it's like a drug or something. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit won't hurt, man. Just, just do it. Just You're going to like it. Like yeah, that's how drug dealers talk. <laughs> you can tell I have lots of experience yeah. with them. <laughs> so I'm no expert or anything like that, but uh, I've done some reading and things like that. And I've stayed at Holiday Inn Express, but um, water is going to be your number one, number one best way to de- uh, rehydrate yourself. Yeah. Um, a lot of people will take grab a Gatorade and think that that takes care of everything. The problem with Gatorade is it's full of sugar and you're out there already under intense or not super intense, but you're under intense uh, situation where you're playing a tournament. So you don't want anything that's kind of messing with you, given the jitteries or stuff like that. Um, most certainly not the quick relief of a monster or any of those type drinks. That is just Jolt. way too much sugar. Yeah. And way too much caffeine. <laughs> Jolt surge. So, um, For me, I'm a water guy. Yeah. Like I, yeah. Eric's always I, got multiple. I probably water, yeah. always have yeah. a Nalgene with water in it. Always. I agree. So. <laughs> what? Some say someone on YouTube. Yeah. Chaser said PDJ bans Dr. Pepper from sanctioned events, citing concerns over abuse by me. <laughs> Sean said, you know, where I can get some Dr. Pepper, man. I got money. It's like that. That reminds me of that, that Dave Chappelle. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, y- y'all got Dr. any Pepper. more of them, Dr. Pepper? <laughs> All right. Next one comes from Sean. Hey, DKM fan. This is uh, Malachi. No, I'm just joking. Is- <laughs> we got Malachi in the house. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Oh, did I hit pause? Hold on, sorry. John from New Jersey. Um, so I had a quick question about uh, thumb placement on top of a disc uh, when you're reaching back to throw. Um, now, I see a lot of pros put their thumb about two to three-ish inches towards the center of the disc. And when um, and a lot of uh, uh, amateurs do it light, right along the, uh, the rim, right on the edge of the disc. And uh, I thought towards the center would be more of a control, uh, control thing, but I see pros doing it even when they're um, on main drives. Uh, so I was just, uh, I figured you'd get more snap with it closer to the edge, but apparently that's maybe not true. I don't know. So I just wanted to get your input and see what you guys thought about it. And uh, thank you very much. Keep it the good work and thank you. Bye. What do you guys think? I think it's, it, it depends. I've seen players where they have their thumb almost all the way toward the center. Yeah. And for me, I just feel like I lose control. Yeah. Not necessarily snap, but lose control and consistency with that. For me, where I like to put my thumb, it, it kind of changes per mold. A little bit, but right on the underneath where the uh, the flight plate meets the rim. So not all the way out at the end of the rim, but on the inside portion of the rim is typically where I like to put an, my thumb and have a nice firm grip right there. Same here. Uh, most of the time it's really like where the pad of your index finger is. You're mm-hmm. almost pinching like with the knuckle of your yep. thumb. That's about where it is. Yep. Yep. So I've seen guys like Garrett Gerthy puts his thumb like, way on the inside when he's trying to throw a distant shot and it's just never or worked out up almost like yeah yeah it's just never worked out for me me either because i've never thrown any distant shots <laughs> <laughs> lifetime next is from crispy he says just uh, picked up an opto ballista pro from the used bin from my local shop well done i immediately fell in love with it my new big distance driver he says 450 feet i believe it those things bomb. Yeah, wow. I want to try different plastics, but I don't know how the plastics affect stability. Can you explain the differences for the Ballista Pro in reference to the Opto? So, do you have any? Well, gold there's mine? really only gold, gold that's yeah. out. Is the only other that I can think of. Moonshine. Yeah, there is some moonshine, I suppose, but the, I do have a moonshine one, and it's very similar to the Opto. Yeah. The the gold line, the ones that are are extremely domey. They have a super pop top to them. Tend to be quite a bit more overstable brand new but i've noticed the more and more i've thrown them the more and more they beat in Mm -hmm. so for longevity reasons i will typically only carry one of those fairly new and uh, one of those fairly beat for for big distance but majority of the time my go-to is the opto i'm pretty much the same as you Uh, we've got we've got moonshine recycled and hybrid i haven't thrown us i think the recycled ones are relatively new and opto air I have thrown an air. Um, I couldn't really get used to the weight of it just because I haven't thrown super lightweight stuff very much. Uh, but I'm the same as you. One pretty stable gold line for the like overstable bomber, mm-hmm. opto in the middle, and then uh, I've got a beat up gold line that's super bomber. Ballista Joel. 
Yes. Smash. Yes. All right, this one's from John, and this has kind of been answered before uh, every no. now and then, but does he want to throw farther? We have no. <laughs> we have only unique questions on this show. <laughs> He says, "Can you explain? Uh, can you can you explain? Can you explain? Can you explain the stability difference in flat top, puddle top, and pop top? What mold? Right. He does not say. It it really depends on the disc, right? There are some discs that um, are more overstable if they are flat, and there are some that are more overstable if they are domey. And it, a lot of it has to do with the the parting line, which is where." the uh, pieces of the mold meet. Generally, if the parting line is a little bit higher, that means the disc is going to be a little bit more overstable. Um, but as a general rule, on when you talk distance drivers, um, Ballista Pros, Enforcers, Defenders, most all of those are going to be more overstable in their domey counterparts mm -hmm. rather would, than their I would flat say ones. mids as well. Mm -hmm. Majority of the time, mids. Fairways, sometimes it seems like the flatter ones are the more overstable. Mm -hmm. The smaller rim. Yep. The reason for that, I have no idea. But anyway, there it is. There, there it is. There it is. That's it. Words. That's what we got. Next one comes from Greg. Luganus? What? Old Greg. What? Still. Have you ever turned Bailey's from issue? <laughs> <laughs> what? It's an old, it's an old Greg, man. It's an old sketch. <laughs> from where? From YouTube. <laughs> oh, sorry. I haven't seen it. No, yeah. uh, it says you're not missing out. I'll from tell you the that. YouTube? <laughs> from, from the YouTubes. Open YouTube picks it up. What, <laughs> 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 what suggestions do you have for when putting on a hill, either up, down, left, or from when you are pin high but standing on a slope? Mm, man, lay up. I'm a push putter. <laughs> I'm a push putter up. who favors a staggered stance. Would I get more power slash control by using a straddle, better center of gravity, or should I shorten slash lengthen my staggered stance to help try to keep my arm swing the same motion slash length? I, any, in go ahead. any insight would be greatly appreciated. Also, thank you, DeGam, for all that you do. do. Sweet. Uh, Danny and I actually made a video on this exact topic just recently. It is called Physics of Flight 3.2, where we talk about putting. And oh. uh, I know. How, how fortuitous. Mind blown. Uh, so go and check out that video. But here's a brief recap. If you are putting downhill, in general, you want to bring your feet a little closer to one another. That allows your arm swing, or sorry, a little farther away from one another, my fault, if you're putting downhill. Mm -hmm. um, that allows your arm swing, the distance of your arm swing to be similar while finishing a little bit less in front of your body. So um, you're, you're going to be less apt to, <laughs> Bobby's just doing stuff over here. Oh, you're going to be less apt to uh, put over the basket very much. And then the opposite goes for uphill. Uh, if you're putting uphill, I like to bring my feet a little bit closer together so my reach back isn't quite as full, but my follow through is longer out in front of my body. That helps me to extend a little bit more to Let the basket. Let me ask you, what would you rather have? If you had an option. Uphill or downhill? Mm -hmm. I'd rather have uphill. Yeah. Okay. I like I like being able to... Watch the disc roll back to you when you miss it? Yes. I like being able to hit one inch short and then just watch it roll back. Uh, I agree. I like uphill as well. Yeah, I like that. Aiming I can, at the band. Mm -hmm. I can be a little bit more aggressive with it. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, you know, if I airball an uphill putt, which I, I mean, I've never airballed any putts, but let's never. just assume that I did once. Okay. Um, generally it's just going to stop right there. Yep. If you airball a Unless downhill you hit metal. Yes. Yes. If you airball a downhill putt, it's a goner. Yep. You are dead. So, um, that's, that's some of that on side hills. Uh, it depends on how steep the side hill is. I sometimes I'll switch to a straddle if the side hill is really steep because, uh, I don't feel like I'm going to lose my balance. If you're kind of straight on, on a side hill, it can feel, I don't know, just kind of weird. Right. So, I'll sometimes switch to a straddle, but um, for the most part, if I can put in a straight on stance, that's my preferred stance. Yep. But yeah, we go into detail on that in the Physics of Flight 3.2. Nice. Check it out on the YouTube. We're hoping to get signed on YouTube, so maybe it'll be permanent. Yeah, we're, we're going to see if they can make it a permanent series. Okay. All right, next one comes from Kyle. Hey, DGM buddies. I was wondering if you ever seen or for foresee smaller A and B tier tournaments paying up front for pro appearances. For example, offering a pro a guaranteed one thousand dollars or whatever wow. to come to their tournament Sign and drum up. up some buzz about it. Uh, P.S. A 
AJ Risley came to our local tournament in Montana, and we loved seeing him and the other pros come cross our courses. Nice. I don't I don't foresee that price tag in the near future. I mean, um, a lot of A tiers actually that's what they pay out for first. Yep. Um, other incentives like maybe free, free hey, place do you to want stay. to come or I'll give you a place to stay. I'll right. give you a, I'll give you your entry paid for. Right. Um, I'll let you set up and sell your discs. I'll let you run a clinic, whatever you want. Those kind of incentives you, you kind of already we hear of those see, quite a bit. Yeah. But a full on maybe. I mean, a full on payment just seems too early. Yeah. Depending on, I guess, on how much it is, but. But if you are interested in having some some guys who are like. Okay at disc golf, you I'm can here. you Let's can do it. you can reach me on Facebook. <laughs> I will come to your tournament for that price, and whether I win or lose, I will be pleased. Yes, thank you. Yeah, but you're probably looking for other people, so I can't speak. I don't for know. That. I I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. This question is from the Oakleys, like the real Oakleys. I don't know. It says, "Hey Bert, yep. other Eric <laughs> and Bobby, don't call me Bob Brown." Wait, he said other Eric. So is he talking to himself? Because yeah. technically he is the other Eric. Let's who be honest here. He wants to know who your favorite uh, touring pro on Team Dynamic Discs is. <laughs> oh, Choose wisely. Okay. Okay. Good also, good. if a breakfast burrito boarded a train moving at 65 miles an hour toward Emporia, Emporia, will you buy us burritos at GBO? No. There's nowhere to buy burritos in Emporia that are good. Uh, hold hold the phone, though. Um, I'll buy you a taco. But Torta El Toro has a fantastic breakfast burrito. Oh, yes. The breakfast they burritos do. are very they good. Do. I haven't had one they of those do. in forever. Great. I'm going to have to have one tomorrow. They they are good. Yeah. But I prefer, I'm a taco guy. Uh, same. Tacos. I life. prefer tacos. However, in the absence of tacos. Those, their tortillas are pretty good. Yeah. I get down with that. Okay. So who's, right, next question. Who's my, <laughs> <laughs> who's my favorite touring pro? I On Team DD. He on specifically DD. asked. Man, I don't, I don't have a favorite. I like all of these guys. Um, I know that's no, a cop out answer, but no, yeah, don't. most of them are. You're finding you're struggling to find when you actually do like. Yeah, that's let's true. Be honest. Well, I, <laughs> let's let's say it this way: there's there's only one of those that's off the team more than the others, and that's Zach. Mm. So let's say everyone but Zach tied for first, Zach last. Zach that's second. That's where yeah. Well, you know, but that's also true. last. That's true. <laughs> uh, He's not wrong. Yeah. So there you go. And yes, I will buy you burritos when you come to Emporia for GPL. Thank you. I would probably have to say Spout. Spirit. It's the best. Sprout. If you or want to sprout. look this up, look up, <laughs> look up PDJ rule 803.02. Robert McCall, if you would please for me, sir, and then we can make sure that we answer those questions. Is this about correctly. breakfast burritos? Yes. During PDJ rule, say it again, 803.02. You got it. Slash breakfast burrito. Uh, this one's from PG Sean. Uh, did you answer the question? Yeah, we're Sure. Good. But what about good. the burritos? We're going to buy them burritos? Yeah, said I said buy. I would. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, folks. I was watching the Downtown Urban competition recently, and one of the competitors' discs ended up under a car. He took relief behind the car, right call, and in line with the rule 803.02. This raised some questions for me. How close to a car should relief be? Foot partially under the car? Far enough back to have an unimpeded throw? Second, if I was flexible enough to get my foot under the car, could I ignore relief? Mm-hmm. Lastly, is lying down considered a legal stance? And actually, I remember yes. quite a few years ago, Dixon and I did a video on this, and we literally used his car. Yep. It was a... Pull it up. It was a... Uh, it was... <laughs> pick him up. Pick him up. Uh, Mark. See. <laughs> it was a PDJ <laughs> Q&A <laughs> rule thing that we did a while back where we did a bunch of Q&A. In fact, I need to like do a throwback Thursday on those because there's some good information. Here it is. You ready? Yes. Rule 803.02. Letter A says a player may obtain relief from the following obstacles that are on or behind the lie. Motor vehicles, harmful insects or animals, people or any item or area as designated by the director, the tournament director is who they're talking about. To obtain relief, the player may mark a new lie that is on the line of play farther from the target at the nearest point that provides relief. So when that disc lands under a car, uh, what that person needs to do is mark it behind the car on the line to the basket um, and then just back up um, enough so that they can make a throw. I would say not so that they are comfortable making a throw because that's not what it says. It says the nearest point of relief. And so that probably means that you're going to have to do a standstill, right? More more than likely. Mm-hmm. 
Or if you're, you know, if the car's short enough, you can just throw over the top of it. How but, about how about verticality? Uh, you mean you you stand on top of the car? Mm-hmm. I don't know the answer to that one. Okay, because that's <laughs> but, what I am doing. <laughs> yes, hundred <laughs> percent. Um, but then the other was if you can fit your foot under the car, then sure, yeah, you're more than you. you Which I would assume majority of the right. time you're going to be able to establish a line. Mm-hmm. But you never have to take relief. You are not forced to take mm-hmm. relief ever. Um, it's an option to you as a player, but, uh, yeah, if you can fit your foot under and you want to go from there, no problem. You're welcome to do that. No problem, Bob. Lying down is a legal stance as long as no part of your body is closer to the basket than the perpendicular line from the basket to your disc. So your hand can be your lie. Your hand could be your lie. Yes. (coughs) Should we listen to this from Dixon Gyres back in 2015? Sure. All righty. So, uh, someone else on my card has thrown underneath this car. How do they take relief? So assuming that the basket is in front of the car, right now the disc is about the middle of the car in both directions. So there's no way that somebody's going to be able to get their foot underneath this car to be able to place it right behind the disc. Now, assuming this is not my car, I'm not going to be able to move it during the round. It's impractical to move this car. I don't think I'm going to be able to get it over. So here's what we're going to have to do. We know where the disc is, so I'm going to draw a line in between the basket and that disc, this the, and I'm going to take relief legit? in a straight line I was just asking if coming you ran up to, to the five car meters first. behind. Now, <laughs> five meters is about 16 feet. I'm not going to need that much space. So what I've got to do is put my a mini marker down on the first available space that is no longer obstructed by this obstacle. So drawing a line through the basket to the middle of the car, I'm going to put my marker right down behind. So this doesn't give me a great stance. I've got this car right in my way. However, now I've got the ability to make this throw where I did not have it ahead of time. Now you don't have to put it so close that you're literally standing on the car. Again, you can get relief from your stance or your throwing motion of a solid object. So I can be behind it a little bit so that there's enough room for me to throw and follow through. Now again, the same way that was for the branch, I'm not giving relief, uh, or I'm not able to take relief from my follow through. So if I wanna do a full run up, it doesn't matter, okay? I just have to be able to stop myself and not hit the car. That's the only relief that I'm given. All right, there you go. (laughs) Straight from 2015, where we did PDJ disc golf rule videos. That's hard to Check us out on YouTube, I know. Yeah, that's crazy. How old are we now? (laughs) Very. 2015 seems like it should have been last year. Yes. Now it's four years ago. It is not. <laughs> oh, dear. All right, let's head over to speak pipe and hear from Weird Grip Frank. Aww. Hey, what's up, Disc Golf Answer Man? This is uh, Frank with the uh, Crazy Grip calling back because um, I just wanted to say, first off, thanks, Danny, for his uh, super awesome instructional videos. Nice. Um it actually really, really helped with nose angle. I'm still throwing with the goofy grip just because I can't seem to figure out the other one, but that's all right. We're working <laughs> on it. I had a quick question. Um, <clears throat> so I have two distance drivers that I'm throwing in my bag for uh, max distance shots. Um, and one is the captain and the other is the freedom. And I'm noticing that the captain... I uh, have it in three different plastics or two different plastics. I noticed that it is a lot more resistant to turn, and I know it is closer to stable. And the freedom, however, is a lot easier to turn. And when you look at them on the chart, they're two away from each other on stability, but the freedom's faster. So my question is, what causes disc to be able to find its true flight i know arm speed and the speed of the disc release has a lot to do with that but is it spin that i'm generating to turn the freedom and get a more consistent 400 foot flight or is it the fact that it's not coming out as fast because that wouldn't make necessarily as much sense to me being that the captain is a slower disc so Look forward to your uh, your insight, and as always, keep up the good work, and uh, adios. It is all in the numbers. You have to look at the numbers, and that is what tells you what the disc. All in the rip. 
Yes. No. <laughs> uh, that's what gauges what a disc will do is it's the numbers. The so don't don't <laughs> go out and throw a disc. <laughs> don't do anything. Don't ask people their opinion. Just look at the numbers. Okay. So uh, you went on for a <laughs> while there. <laughs> <laughs> you upset about that or something? No, or? I'm just playing. So um, what's the real answer? But you're accurate. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here's here's the uh, here's the real answer. So. <laughs> Sometimes uh, high-speed understable discs will act um, a little bit more stable than they are based on how fast they're going, right? So if somebody with Eric's arm speed throws a freedom, it will go from hyzer to flat to roller. Yes. Upside down. Maybe on its back. Probably um, but he's But he's got a lot of arm speed. Um, the captain will go from hyzer to flat to ride right, but probably not really roll um, for him. Um, Depends on height. Yeah, I guess it really depends on height. But the difference between those two is that if someone with a, a slower arm speed is throwing it, because the captain does have that wider rim, it's going to act a little bit more overstable than it would for someone like Eric. And the question of what what gets a disc its true flight is getting it to the speed necessary for it to fly the way it's like the way that the numbers are written, right? Um, so when we test out discs, when we assign flight numbers. That's what we're playing for is if you can throw this disc as fast as it needs to be thrown to do what it's supposed to do, like how, how the numbers are written, then that's how you get it to its intended flight is throwing it at that mm-hmm. speed. Um, if the freedom is flying, you know, if the freedom is flying more overstable than a captain, I would say it's definitely not the right speed disc for you. But since you said it is a little bit more understable, I'd say those are probably in a pretty good sweet spot for you. I'd agree. Anyway, I think, I think that's it. That good? Yeah. All right. Next question comes from uh, Caleb. Hey, Disc Golf Answer Man, fam, wrestling with the Ballista Pro Enforcer and Defender. I bag three Ballista Pros and three Enforcers. Enforcer is more trustworthy for stability, but times when I do connect with the Ballista Pro, it gets big distance. I feel Ballista Pro is longer, it's a longer defender. Will you all share your thoughts on differences between molds and the difference between the plastics of those molds? What do you like for what shots and why? I'm around 950 and get good distance. Sweet. Dang, he throws uh, 950 feet? Bro. My Arkansas friends will vouch for me. What uh, What was the three? Did he say three discs? Ballista Pro, Enforcer, and a Defender. Oh, okay. Those defender. Are, defender, yeah. So kind of <clears throat> run through the difference of those. For areas. me personally, the Defender and the Enforcer are pretty similar flight wise that that I get out of it. So I actually only bag the enforcer because of how long I've yeah thrown the thrown enforcer. It's just been in the bag forever. So it's it's a staple. Um there's absolutely times when I'll throw an enforcer over a ballista pro. The ballista pro will typically only come out of the bag if I'm needing max distance. Yeah. Uh when I'm throwing an enforcer, it's much more controllable for me. I can uh throw it in wind uh, if I if I know what I need the disc to do, I'm probably going to reach for an enforcer, whether it's a new one or if it's one I've got in the bag that's a little bit more beat up. That um, a, a hole that comes to mind uh, on Jones East is hole number nine. Uh, that tee shot, a lot of times it depends on what the wind is doing, but if if I'm just trying to throw it down the middle of that fairway and I have a bit of a headwind coming up, I'm reaching for a a beat-in enforcer every time. And the reason is the Ballista Pro for me, I need more room for it to work. Uh, That that particular hole, if you're not familiar with it, it's a downhill, uh, pretty pretty long hole. I'm not sure the distance on it off the top of my head. Over 600, I'd say. Definitely, yeah. Um, But you got to hit a gap. And for me, the Ballista Pro, I need more room. I need more air for it to work. Uh, the, the two discs are very similar for s- kind of maybe slower arm speeds. Yep. If you have a little bit slower of an arm speed, the Ballista Pro and Enforcer, there could be some overlap there. Mm-hmm. But if you can, you know, get an Enforcer to do what it's kind of supposed to do, then there's absolutely a big enough difference between the two. Yeah. Um, plastic types, I think they're pretty similar. Like, like Eric said, I think Fusion might beat in just a hair faster than Lucid, mm-hmm. but it's not like, Wow, that's a way faster. You won't even probably be able to tell the difference yeah, between the two. It's a really minute difference. Um, but yeah, if you're not getting those discs up to that speed, you know, if you're not throwing them 380 to 400 feet, you're not going to see a big difference in stability yeah. unless it's straight headwind. So, 
Um, and, and I think something that's cool to, uh, that, that Eric was kind of referencing was whole nine there at Jones East. Um, sometimes he'll throw an enforcer down there, but just as a tip outside of these disc choices, but sometimes he'll just throw an explorer down there. Sometimes he'll just throw an Emac truth down mm-hmm. there just to make sure that he finds the fair. Yeah, way. If there's no wind, I'm, yeah. I'm reaching for a mid all the time. Yeah. For placement. Right. So even though it's a long hole, that doesn't mean that you necessarily have to throw driver off yeah. it every time. Placement. I throw explorer. It's all, about placement. it's all about putting yourself in position yeah. to make the second shot into the green Much the easier. most comfortable shot. So if that's a 400 foot or a 300 foot shot, then mm-hmm. put yourself in that position. Yep. I throw explorer off that tee almost every time mm-hmm. I play it. So. Get away from me a lot yep. lately too. For sure. So on the disc, uh, we have a disc golf answer man Facebook group. Hope if you're on Facebook, go ahead and go out there and join it. We have a really big group. It's a uh, ten thousand over ten thousand. Yeah, it's saw it pretty good. Like ten ten thousand three hundred. Is, is it ten thousand three? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, which is so we've got a lot. And what's interesting, we've got a lot of people that are on the group that discover it through Facebook, but don't realize they have a podcast. So it's true. to make sure these people know we have a podcast out there. Of course, the group is called disc golf fans Man podcast, but the people listening probably know we have a podcast. This is say. true. So I put a question on there it says when putting a lot of people pick a spot in the basket to aim for, what is that spot for you? And so far it's at 101 comments. Nice. Nice. Um, so I saw that. make sure you get on there. Cause we're going to be doing a lot more of this in 2019 where we'll all put questions out there or, uh, different things out there to keep the uh, group engaged. Uh, but I'm just going to run through a few. I see someone says high right change. Uh, someone says, I usually pick a link uh, middle of the pole. I even have a neon, a strip of neon orange tape around my practice basket where I'm aiming at. Cool. Hmm. So that was interesting. Chain link on the inner strand, just right of the pole, two to three links above the cage, uh, the pole, just right of the pole and about a third down from the band mid height. First link, right of the pole. Depends on where I am inside the circle. I aim for the middle of the pole. Outside, I'm outermost chains, middle of the pole height. Um, some people said, uh, um, depends on the wind and things of like course, that. So, of course. a lot of the chains, a lot of people bit picking uh, specific links. Uh, what do you guys aim for whenever you're putting? I aim at the lock. <laughs> Play for the headwind lift. <laughs> yeah, you must pray for it a lot of lifts. I have it, really bad vision, so I, it's just a blur to me. <laughs> been varied results. So I, far. I, I aim for the thing that's sitting still. Yes. yes. If it's not moving, I'm throwing yes. at it. Uh, for me, I like to put nose up, so I'm typically aiming about two to three links above the top of the bottom of the basket. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And uh, the chain link that is typically just to the right side of the pole. I pick the chain. I play. I pick my chain link on the left side of the pole, just on the left side, but with the knowledge that I have a one of my eyes is well. Everybody has a more dominant eye than than the other, uh, but mine is right eye dominant. So when I am looking at that link, my body is actually facing to where I hit, just right of the pole most of the time. Uh, so I pick that link and I watch it all the way through when I put. And uh, mm-hmm. the intent is for it to hit center pole or air on the right side. But to get there, I look at a link just on the left side. I mean, like a, a yeah. half an inch on the left side of the pole. Yeah. For me, it's it's honestly, if I'm missing putts, it's not because I'm I'm visualizing or, or staring at the wrong chain link. It's because I'm not following through. Yep. That is, yeah, that is 90% great. of the time I'm missing putts is because I'm not following through. Yeah. That's what we said on the physics of flight video too. Like, mm-hmm. It, it almost doesn't matter what your form looks like, what stance you use, what type of putt you use. If you're not falling through, you're not going to make putts. That's all there is to it. Yeah. You have to follow through to make putts. Yeah. Excellent. Next one is from Steven. Uh, I have always thrown right hand forehand because I had better control of distance. I could get a control drive about three to 350 with a distance drivers. Hmm. Recently, I decided to minimize my bag and force myself to learn backhand. Using four fairways, my best backhand drives up to or go 220 to 240 with minimal control, which is frustrating. One, are the benefits of backhand worth the growing pains to improve my non-professional game? Two, should I focus on field work or just playing rounds only backhand? Thanks for all you do. That's kind of the opposite of most people's problems, I would say. Yeah. Because most people are backhand dominant. I would maybe not beginning starting out, but <clears throat> but um Huh. That's a that's a good question. I would say 
for me personally, how, how I have, when I was traveling and playing more events, trying to work on my forehand, how I would do it is just incorporate it into my practice rounds. Not necessarily go out and play an entire round with that, because if I go out and play an entire round forehand, I'm going to feel it. Yeah, I'm going to be sore. I may not even be able to lift my arm the next day. So that's not something I'd recommend. I would recommend throwing a couple here and there uh, on shots where uh, you're throwing a forehand. Maybe you should try to throw just a turnover shot in that mm-hmm. in that place or next to it. You know, I'm, and I'm talking just during casual rounds when you're out just practicing. Uh, field work works great too, but once again, don't overdo yourself. Right, and it really comes down to what you're trying to get out of disc golf. Yeah, you know, you said you said it yourself. Too. Yeah, you said you're not trying to be a professional. Um, that would be like all right. So when I when I go out to the golf course, I am noted not good at golf right i'm fine at golf but i just enjoy going to play but i hit kind of a natural fade so that finishes to the right and i've tried uh working on hitting a draw but it's super frustrating because that's not the way my body naturally wants to hit the ball um for me i don't really care that much because i'm just going out there to have fun i'm never gonna go get on the pdg uh, sorry pdj tour i have been on that one before (laughs) i'm never gonna go get on the pga tour or one of the mini tours or anything like that i just go enjoy myself so if you are enjoying yourself playing forehand only, no problem. Mm-hmm. If you want to improve on something, I definitely think it's worth the growing pains to have a good forehand and backhand just so that anytime you approach a hole, you know that you've got the shot in your bag to throw on it. Yep. So I think it's I think it's absolutely worth it unless you just really don't care about that and you really enjoy playing forehand all the time. Play forehand all the time. That's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh huh. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm reading this question and it's old. You should read it to us. I was going to say, you ought to read that for everyone. <laughs> Do you want me to read this one? Okay. This is from Josh and Gabe from Minnesota. Uh, we're playing a disc golf road trip from June ni- for June uh, 2019. We're starting in Emporia and working our way back to Southeast Minnesota. It's Minnesota. Not, that's, that's not an old question. No, it's dated 1230. Okay, that's like... Oh, I guess it's not that old. It's a couple yeah, weeks ago. June, yeah, June 2019 when I saw 18, hasn't 20, happened yet. That's true. When I saw 2019, <laughs> 2018, I thought, man, it's old. Man, that's uh, like last year. year man. So last year. <laughs> what are the most played courses from Emporia to Southeast Minnesota? Come on. Are Southeast we a travel Minnesota? agency? It's anyway. not that far. <laughs> Here, here's your answer. Everything in Ohio. Everything in Iowa. There you go. We'll be off for a week and looking to play one to three courses a day. We're interested in playing tournaments, but we're not. they're not a necessity. We're intermediate level players. What courses should we play? Can we give our email for more info? <laughs> okay, so we're gonna be we're gonna become a disc golf uh, tourist uh, travel agency. Yes, here's what you can do that's actually gonna be even better than us planning your trip for Say you. Yes, in response, we'll message your FB, Facebook, Skull Vikes. F- keep it real. FBI, oh. I think is what he was trying to say. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, go to go download the UDisc app. Right. Do it. Open it up and be like, hey, this is this is the city that I'm going to be in. And it will show you all the disc golf courses there along with ratings of those courses. Most of them have course maps. Yeah. Uh, they have previous rounds there so you can compare how you play. There's some hidden gems out there that, that you won't know. Sure. As far as the rating system goes. But it'll give right. you a, a general idea. Of yeah, of like play. these are the most popular courses or the ones that people rated yeah. the highest. Mm-hmm. Um, just in general, for driving from Kansas up to Minnesota, like Eric said. Um, Des Moines. That's Des Moines is great disc golf. fantastic. I've, I've played a few courses there, and I enjoy it a lot. Mm-hmm. It's super duper cool. Um, then where else? Kansas I mean, City has some yep. really solid courses Waterworks as well. Waterworks is awesome. Um, where else would you say in Kansas City that you like to play? Um, Kansas City, I like. I like usually when I'm there. Waterworks is our go-to. Um, Rosedale's fun because you can stop in and and check out the DDKC shop right there and eat some really good barbecue or Thai food right down the road. Nice. Um, Bad Rock Creek is a pretty fun one, and you know I played a uh, uh, Heritage there in 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 what town is that in? Just like it's. Olathe area, I think, but it's a, it's a fun course. Nice. It's a Scott Reed course, but it's a, it's a fun course. I Sweet. really enjoy it. So, and then once you're in Minnesota, I mean, I don't know. Well, they're coming from there, aren't they? Oh yeah. So yeah. they should know. Yeah. You know, Minnesota stuff. It's South Minnesota. I thought he said. So. Right. Anything in yeah. anything there, there's so many good courses just off the I-35 corridor. And if actually, if you shoot over and go down toward, uh, Omaha, 
Council Bluffs, there's a couple nice courses in that area as well. So, yes, there you go. Next question comes from Jake. The Snake Rock. I'm going to paraphrase because um, the question's kind of jumbled here. Uh, basically, it looks like he uses a Discraft magnet, saw a soft Discraft magnet. What NDD lineup uh, of putters is the closest? It doesn't have to be soft plastic because I want to be able to throw it off the tee as well. I would say similar be a deputy. Yes. Magnet seems to be relatively straight to understable uh, for throwing, and that's very similar to the deputy. Yep, those are the ones. Johnny V said he had been putting with magnets for a long time and mm-hmm. was going to try out some new putters, and I sent him some deputies. He said he's been liking them a lot. Good. This one is from Adam. Hello, I'm from Salmon Falls. Ooh. Disc golf. Cr- oh, no, I'm a local of Salmon Falls Disc, of course, in New Hampshire. Ten of the 18 holes have OB water, so lost discs are common. Yes. Mm-hmm. I bag three Lucid Emacs and a yeah. Lucid Verdict as my mid-ranges. Problem is, I lost my Super Filippi and my Straight to Filippi uh, Emac in the past three days. I followed Emacs rule can have. Huh? I followed Emacs rule can have multiple Emacs, but need mm-hmm. to break in a few Lucid. Prefer Lucid and same tips. I have heard putter. Hmm. I've heard putter <laughs> grammar. I have heard putting them in the dryer. <laughs> Throwing them at walls. Any help for the person about to go swimming in the New Hampshire for missing Emac truths? I think sometimes people use speak to talk, speak to talk, speak to text, and then they don't look to see if it. Anyway, yeah, I bet that's right. I Let's go with guys. it. I love you guys. I do. I love every one of you. How do you work in? To be fair, you've done it to me when I've read some of your texts too. This is true. So. <laughs> <laughs> DC Stroop. How do you work in uh, an Emac truth? I'm probably not the right guy to ask this question. All right, because you just throw a bunch of them. Well, I've got a bunch of them. Correct. I've got a buttload of them that I can cycle in and out, and that's how I've done it. I've cycled them in and out. I've got new ones. I've put new ones in the bag. I've thrown them for a couple weeks. I've taken them back out and just basically cycled them in and out. But if I'm trying to beat in a disc um, quickly, typically how I'll do it is throw it on every single hole during casual rounds, no matter if that – particular hole like if it's an 800 foot hole i'll still throw it just right constantly throwing especially in new hampshire there's a lot of trees so you can very beat in discs relatively quick so that's kind of my suggestion i don't necessarily recommend going and throwing them into a brick walls or putting it in the dryer or anything like that i i I personally prefer to get my discs beat in by throwing them yep that's definitely the way to do it Mm -hmm. if you are going to beat in a disc unnaturally uh, a good way to do it is put a towel on the ground and grab it in a forehand grip and throw it on the ground. That will not give you dings on the side of your disc, oh, like yeah. just throwing it onto straight up concrete, but it will emulate hitting trees, hitting the ground, hitting rocks. What if you like miss that. the towel? Well, then you're sad and <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> and throw it in the river. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a goner. But yeah, that works. All right. Next question comes from Shay. I'm not condoning that. I'm just saying. Hello, Bobby Still owes Robert his Torchies Brown. My man. Robert, captain of Team Dang It, McCall. Dang it. And Eric, probably not there, McCabe. Yeah, but he's here. Jay, False. Robert's wife from Pennsylvania. So, today, I have a question about out of bounds. Imagine a dead straight hole with plenty of trees in the fairway and a creek running parallel to the fairway on the right hand side. I throw my drive, I hit a tree as I am wont to do, this turns 90 degrees and lands in the water. The bank of the creek is dangerously muddy and or steep, uh, well beyond the one meter relief. My question is, is a retee my only real option? I know there is a rule allowing you to proceed back along the line of play, but my understanding is that is relative to the spot uh, of the meter in for uh, coming out of bounds, uh, which means the line of play would go through the creek and then eventually put me on the other side, which is far from ideal. Uh, Say thanks for your help and keep it real. What do you guys got? Isn't that the new rule that you can do that, but it's on the line of play? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to pull this up. Yeah, and you do that. See, uh, see what it says officially. You can you you can take your meter or you can retee. You can always have the option to retee. Mm-hmm. All right. Here it is. Wait. 
There it is. That wasn't it. Nope, that's not it. I know uh, I don't see it on here. I, I know there's something about the lie being dangerous. So if it's if it's to where you can't you can't even stand on the side of it, then I think the tournament director would say that you can take your meter in from like the the edge of where it drops off. Mm-hmm. Um, you definitely would not just have to re tee. There's there's always the option to where it went out of bounds. Um, you you just take your meter in from that safe position. Now, if it just kind of sucks, like you can, if it's, say it's really muddy and slippery, but it's not super steep and you can stand in it, but it's not favorable, sorry, got to do it. Mm-hmm. But if it was unsafe, especially if you were pay- playing a tournament, I think the director, the tournament director would be um, foolish to not either flag it or something to mark that OB and just say, don't go down there at all. Uh, or just say in the rules, you take your meter from up top. Yeah, that's what I would say. There you go. We good? Yep. Next one is from Corey. Hey, disc golf answering crew. I have a question about adding, subtracting, swapping discs during an event. What is the legality of this? Say, for example, you're playing a tournament and something happens to a disc on hole two, and you know you want need something to fill that hole by hole eight. Hole eight. Can you send someone to your car to grab a disc for you? Yep. If you're well prepared, you'd have an appropriate disc in the bag already, but this is something that has been on my mind and wondering your, wondering your thoughts. Yes. Unless they've yes. changed this rule, you can, like, I don't know how many times that I've walked past my car in the parking lot and got in there and got a different disc out. I've done that a couple times. Yep. You can absolutely do that. You can go back to your car and get it as long as you're not, as long as it's not like your turn to throw and you take more than your 30 seconds you can do that. Or if you have somebody to send, you can absolutely send somebody to the car and get a new one. You can buy a new disc on the way by if tournament central is there and you have uh, adequate time. So yeah, you can absolutely do that. Yep. There you go. Yes. There it is. All right, guys, this is going to be the last question for the audio podcast. YouTubers get your, uh, your uh, questions ready for the, the, uh, after the podcast, after the podcast trademark. We're going to trademark after the podcast. We can't do after show because of podcast that shall go unnamed. Yes, uh, but we can, we'll call ours after the podcast. All right. So this one is from Ron Burgundy. Hello, Bobby. Cool. Daddy. Slick breeze. That's an Eric. Of course, does Eric. Wait a minute. I want to hear that again. First of all, that's awesome. Yeah. Hello, Bobby. Cool. Daddy. Slick breeze. (laughs) Eric. (laughs) Course designer extraordinaire McCabe and Robert, the voice McCall. You're, this you're is the Ron voice, Ron. Indy, yeah. southeastern Kansas. And first of all, condolences on the Chiefs' loss in the AFC Championship game. I know it hurts, man. As a as a Vikings fan, I have suffered six oh, consecutive NFC have. Championship oh. defeats dating back to the 1977 season. Yeah. I've watched them all, man. I can feel your pain. Also, kudos to Doug Bierkus for his incredible sense of style and his apparel choice. It is always good to see a fellow <laughs> Vikings fan here in Kansas, man. So, uh, nice updates. Anyway, I onto my question. I started playing last June. I'll be 54 in May, and I've dealt with several injuries. I've never been a real flexible guy. Um, same. And I've heard you guys Not talk same. about uh, injuries and and things like that, and some stretching. And I was wondering if there are any stretching programs that you could point me in the direction of that could help me as far as uh, minimizing these injuries. I've dealt with a tennis elbow and uh, a hip flexor, strained hip flexor in my left leg. So any help you guys could give me would be great. Um, Thanks for everything you guys do and uh, grow the sport. Hope to see you guys at the glass blown open. I will be there. Yeah. If you do come Ron, I want to, Meet you. I want to shake your hand. I want so. to shake your voice. I don't. <laughs> um, I was to say I want to get. I want to get you in radio. Like if you're not a, maybe a radio personality do, maybe already, to the studio and do yeah. like an yeah. intro or something. That's right for us. You, you need to have him say "Cool Daddy Slick Breeze" for you. Yes. If you're not already in radio, what, do I say you have missed your opportunity, my friend. I that is kidding. a that's a voice right there. That's impressive. That is a sultry voice. Um, I don't know if it's sultry. I don't know. <laughs> Just trying to. Th- you anyway, took, you took it all weird. So what is this? What yeah. is this? Qu- okay, so this is what I'm going to suggest you do. If you have not already checked out, go to discoffstrong.com. Yes, Seth Mr. Muncy. Yes, Mr. Muncy does a great job at. In fact, right now he's uh, training with Eric Oakley, Tina Stenitis, and I believe I saw. Uh, why can't I think of her name? Madison Walker. Madison Walker just joined them out there to doing some stuff on Instagram and Instagram stories. Uh, but that's his whole thing. He. 
He used to do physical therapy for, uh, I can't remember what, hockey league. Do you remember hockey It team? was the Penguins, I think. Was it the Penguins? Yeah. Um, so I know he, he did he did profession, other professional athletes. Yeah, well, he did so. other, and he's got uh, a... a ja Rule. Ja Rule. He's got a long <laughs> list of credentials um, behind his name. So, um, <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> Seemed right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, check out discgolfstrong.com. He's got a lot of exciting things for the 2019 season, and he's got a lot of things to help with injuries, to help prevent injuries, mm. to help you work through injuries and things like that. So that's the best <laughs> advice I can give you. All right, Audio Podcast, thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate everything you guys do. Uh, real quick note, hopefully you've hung on. The whole, uh, uh, we talked about on YouTube before we started recording, but the whole thing about uh, beating your rating, uh, if you've missed that, uh, if you just started listening, I have a goal of uh, getting being rated to 850. 850. Um, and you're currently... Don't remember. 807. Yep. And uh, Anthony said, I'll take that. Uh, I'm 906. I will see if I can be 950 in 2019. So we've got some, we're going to have to figure out how to make it interesting. Uh, But uh, then a lot of the listeners are like, well, I want to improve. So what I'm going to do is on the Facebook group. And if you're like, I'm not on Facebook. Well, I'm sorry. There's billions of people on Facebook. So this is the (laughs) best place to put it. Um, We're going to do it on Facebook where we're going to do check-ins whenever PDGA does a rating update. I'm going to check in and I'm going to tell you what my rating is. And I'm going to tell you whether I'm happy or sad or what I did to do better, what I should do better. And then that will give us a, a discussion thread. Well, you guys can then report in saying, oh, my rating was this. Now it's this. I'm happy because of this, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's where we're going to do the whole uh, 850 rating updates, chase it the 850 or I don't know what we're going to call it. That sounds that chase rolls the right off the tongue. Chase the 850. Yep. The 850 chase. That has some so, motto written all over it. Yes. Yeah, so hey, super fast before we turn off the audio podcast yeah. though. We have new releases coming out. We've talked about them some on the podcast, but we have one that we've now seen a flight of that we hadn't last week. The Raider. Oh yes. And it the Raider looks fantastic. A fantastic. It's mm. it's fantastic. Uh it's going to be awesome. Um we've we've only seen one flight of it so far. They are producing them right now and we are supposed to have them here in just a couple of weeks. Um if you are a member of Team Trilogy, keep your eyes on the Facebook page. Uh we've got a special thing going on for Team Trilogy members where we're going to offer them uh an early shot at getting a Raider before uh, some other people do. So if you've been on the fence about jo- joining Team Trilogy and you haven't just yet, this is a fantastic time to look into it. You will get your hands on a Raider before nearly ever everyone else. Mm-hmm. I think Jeremy talked about that on his second. Yeah, that was on the mm-hmm. update yeah. updates one yesterday. But um, just in case you weren't listening to that, mm-hmm. look into it. This disc, I think it's going to be a game changer for us. Fit, I think it's going to be ridiculous. Yeah, fit right in between a trespass and enforcer. Um, I'm sure I'll be carrying at least a couple of them. I'm excited. Yes. So check that out. If you haven't already, do it. Now. Hey, do it. Do it.